I wanted to ask you about is what is your process for writing dialogue? Because I think your dialogue is sort of instantly distinctive, even from your first film. It's so fully formed. So I'm really curious to hear about that. Well, um, I was really struggling trying to write um, fiction, and <clears throat> it involved always having to have some other um, sort of creative persona who would then do a first person account. And it became very complicated, sort of creating this fictional persona would then say all kinds of stupid things and, and be kind of comical, et cetera, et cetera. But um, it took forever and was kind of frustrating and, and monotonous. And uh, I had no confidence at all in, in starting a screenplay, but then um, it started going better. And I realized that with um, film dialogue, all the dialogue is not going to be spoken by me, it's going to be by these four actors who are creating characters and saying all the yeah. stupid things. And um, so it, it separate everything an actor says is first person monologue cut, cut up in little pieces. And um, in the course of, of writing, I was thinking that these young people are trying to say true things. They're, they're trying to say true things. And so I'd write a scene saying true things. And then the next day, I'd go back to say, well, you know, that isn't true. That really isn't true. And so I think, I, do I throw everything out? Um, and then I got the brainstorm that's another character could contradict them. <laughs> and so a lot of the um, a lot of the dialogue is this sort of interior dialogue. You say one thing and say that's not really true. You say the other thing and it goes on and on, and it can lead to a punchline. Yes. And and it's really thanks to the punchline that we're here. Yes. No. It's always so witty and just there's such a sort of sparkle to all of the dialogue that is so great. There's a real problem with punchlines though because um, when you go abroad, people translating films very often are very serious, very smart people with no sense of humor at all. <laughs> and so when they come to a punchline, they think there is an error. There's an error here, and this line doesn't make any sense, so they change it. <laughs> Luckily here with this audience, all of the punchlines come through. Um, can you talk a bit about your casting process for the film? Because I noticed watching this again in the introduction, or in the credits rather, it says introducing for everyone, and they're all kind of, you know, Unknown, act, unknown actors at the time. So can you talk a bit about what your casting process was and how you assembled this wonderful cast of characters? Yeah, well, I, I think it's something um, that would be really great if we had in the industry uh, all the time, which is totally open casting. So I think you can do casting through managers and agents and all the usual things, but I think there always should be an open casting session or sessions. With us, it was absolutely essential that we cast that way. So um, we had no credibility, no clout, no money. And um, I was running a tiny illustration cartoonist agency, and the girlfriend of one of the cartoonists um, was an assistant for a very good casting director, Bonnie Timberhunt. Mm -hmm. And um, she said, what you do is you, you know, rent a rehearsal space, put an ad in backstage, and I'd been in the business selling films, so I knew sort of how to write an ad that would make it look like there's a film that's gonna come out, you know, you oh. can try to, try to come, come for it. Mm -hmm. And 300 people showed up for the first um, audition. We were really lucky that this is just the right age group for a lot of aspiring actors uh, in New York. And um, half the cast were among the first 50 people who showed oh. up. So they sort of knew it was for them. And it was actually Chris Eigenman who played Nick here and then went on to sort of play a similar character in the next two films. Mm -hmm. Chris Eigenman put up the sign-up sheet, so he was the first person there. Mm -hmm. oh, wow. and, uh, yeah. Wow. yeah, that's fascinating. And can you talk a bit about, because I know you mentioned like some of the work you had done before and um, working in agency, stuff like that, how your background outside of film might have influenced this film, because it sounds like you already had a lot of experience in other arenas before coming to film, which is quite interesting. Yeah, I was just uh, sort of talking to a critic friend who um, is so knowledgeable uh, about contemporary film and, and recent decades, and um, I was coming really from the point of view of being failed in literature. <laughs> so I was trying, I was in, in, in college, we were totally obsessed with 18th century 
um, in 19th century literature through sort of Fitzgerald and Elon Wall. And so it was sort of aspiring in that area and failing, and then coming into a different area that I was also fascinated by, and I've sort of gotten into the Spanish film industry, um, gotten some experience, been, um, so, so what happened is I was trying to get into the film business as a film literateur, <laughs> and I was going over to Spain to get married, and Variety had this special issue on the Spanish film industry. And on the flight, I read this like three times. And I went to a dinner party in Madrid with a lot of, a number of writers, um, directors, and producers saying that um, they should sell their films in the United States with Galavision, all these things like that. So I started selling Spanish films. And then they needed a, um, it, they needed a ridiculous American to speak bad Spanish in their films. <laughs> and they didn't want to go to the expense of casting in Los Angeles. So I got cast in their films and sort of saw how it was done. And I had the script for Barcelona when I was shooting um, uh, on a long shoot. I was just talking to, to an actor earlier and they were talking about sort of being forced to be on a shoot for several months when they only had like a week's work mm -hmm. and I was the least important person um, on a shoot that was sort of a three month shoot and they kept me in Madrid the whole uh, summer so it was actually great for me because <laughs> I got per diems mm -hmm. and um, I could observe everything and so I had the script for Barcelona I was working on but I realized that it was too ambitious a film um, to shoot abroad and I got the idea of doing something that could be essentially shot in a room mm -hmm. and that is this film. Yeah, and I just think it's so impressive considering it's a low-budget independent film, how aesthetically cohesive it is, both in costumes, sets, location, everything just works together so well. So can you talk a bit about how you were able to achieve that on a small budget? Because it seems, you make it look easy, but I imagine it's quite difficult. Well, the idea was how to make something look expensive without much money, and so to try to make, um, everything looks sort of elegant and, and fine that we could. And we were really lucky that um, the, um, the head of a formal wear company was charmed by a production assistant who <laughs> went to ask him for his help and he gave us all the, uh, all the uh, men's formal clothes and he appears in the film as, as the tailor. Um, and, he, and he said he, he made so much money off our film that he could buy a country house. Wow. Um, because it was like an ad targeted just to his audience. And so um, um, we had a wonderful um, production manager who initially turned me down. I pleaded with him to, to do a Brian Greenbaum, who died sadly a few years later. Um, and. Um, <clears throat> He, he was so charming, I thought this guy, which is a perfect production manager, but he said, it's impossible to do this film um, on, that, on that money. He said, you have to get all the locations yourself. Mm -hmm. So um, all the locations were donated except for our big expense, which was the, um, the debutante party scene that you see the interior. That's the surrogate's court building. Um, in New York and so the sort of magic thing in shooting in New York is if you get a small insurance policy you can get <laughs> permits and the city allows you to shoot in buildings and that was our most expensive location because we had to pay the security guards but they gave it to us for free so it, it was essentially just finding those locations mm -hmm. yeah that's so interesting <clears throat> and can you speak a little bit about some of your influences for this film, whether they were cinematic or literary or artistic, because clearly watching the movie, you're pulling in references from so many different categories. So I'm very curious to hear about that. Well, I was, I been when I was this age, I was obsessed with Fitzgerald and just in love with that world and um, trying to sort of try to write Fitzgerald as things set in the present. And um, so, so, but along the way, I'd fallen in love with Jane Austen, and um, like when I was in between trying to write scenes, I'd go and be reading Jane Austen, and um, she gave us kind of the plot to the movie because um, that Mansfield Park, Lionel Trilling thing sort of creates the dilemma of the true session and Audrey standing up uh, against it and, and all that. And so, um, <clears throat> 
And I think I got very upset when Vincent Campy in the New York Times said in a review of Top Hat, the Fred Astaire Ginger Rogers movie, that people don't dress that way anymore. <laughs> so I actually wrote a letter to the Times that got published for testing. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> can you remember like what you said in that letter? That's that's amazing. I, I signed it as executive director of New York Committee to save the white tie. Wow. <laughs> I respect that. Um, so how does it feel watching the movie, revisiting it over 30 years later? Well, I was really delighted to see the end of it uh, tonight because I thought it looked really terrible. <laughs> <laughs> because I, I, as you start a new script, you sort of feel that, that this is really mediocre and you know these other films people like and I'm not gonna do that again. And so it's really reassuring to see how bad this film is. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm more hopeful of the current script than I was so impressed by. That is, I, I feel it's like fixed in editing. I feel like I, I, the audience would not agree with your assessment. No, but I mean, I mean really, really, you know, cinematography, mm -hmm. editing, and music help films a lot. Of course. Also actors. Yes, inevitably. Um, and can you talk a bit about, do you have any current projects that you're working on or things coming up? I do. Great. And I think there'll be something that will be sort of publicized, like not yet financed, mm -hmm. but I think there'll be that sort of promotional mention of something next month. Yeah. And do you have a favorite line from this film? There's just so many quotable lines. I mean, I keep coming back to, you know, as I approach the end of my life term, I keep coming back <laughs> to, to Brook Farm. Uh, you know, just because it dies doesn't mean it's a failure. Wow. <laughs> very, very existential. Or not existential. Or not existential. <laughs> <laughs> um, You're the best, you know. This is the best you I've ever had. Oh my god, thank you. That's very kind of you to say. I think um, we actually have some medals for people here. Uh, medals? Yeah, because. <laughs> We have a the Westerly Films Archive auction going on oh, on wow. eBay that we're constantly promoting on Twitter and getting great results. And um, one of the stars of uh, Damsels in Distress, one of the DU boys from that, is um, is is running it, Chris Angerman, and he's come with our little medals, which actually are just buttons that say doom, bourgeois, and love. <laughs> I was actually wanting to ask you, how did you come up with the doom, bourgeois, and love? And like, what does that, what what does that represent to you? Like, it's just such a beautifully evocative phrase. Well, I think, um, I think our difficulty with this film was getting people not to hate the, the people in it, not to, hate, <laughs> not to hate the subject matter of the world and the people in it. And so they sort of have to pour mouth everything and they have to be depressed and doomed and, and failures. Yes. But they're in love. Um, so, I mean, it's trying to be funny, but also trying to, I mean, it's, it's also sort of accurate because yeah. if you're around some of these people, you do get the feeling of doing bourgeois and in love. Yeah, and just the way. It's descriptive. That, yes, and how everything they encounter is just like has this dramatic tension and weight to it. And can you talk a little bit about how you see this movie relating to all of your other films? Because I know like the Dune Bourgeois Love is something of a trilogy with Barcelona and Last Days of Disco. So can you talk a bit about the Whit Stillman extended cinematic universe, as it were? <laughs> <laughs> and I apologize for using that phrase. <laughs> um, well, so I, I started the uh, Barcelona script first. That was the first idea. And that came out of um, seeing, uh, I, I went to see a film I really, really hated, and <laughs> Officer and the Gentleman was 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 playing um, nearby, and so we went and saw Officer and Gentleman, and I really loved the movie, and I went back to Madrid, my my friends in cinema in in Spain, and mentioned that I liked the film. They said, "Oh, how could you like that? It's facha, it's fascist, it's fascist." Because anything pro-military in any sense was um, facha from their point of view. So I thought, what about doing an officer and a gentleman mm -hmm. in Barcelona, but they're two people. There's the, and the idea of the two cousins. So I had the two cousin characters in Barcelona, officer and a gentleman, all the anti-Americanism in Spain then. 
NATO, OTAN, all these subjects that are still contemporary. And, um, and um, did Metropolitan want to go on to do Barcelona and discover Taylor Nichols and Chris Agamemnon, who sort of became friends? They became sort of quasi roommates in the sense they shared places in Los Angeles and New York as they were trying to do casting stuff. And so I wrote it, finished writing the script for them, and that became sort of two films that were sort of coherent in a sense. And then <clears throat> when I was in the editing room in Barcelona, in shooting Barcelona, the nicest days were shooting discos because the terrible thing in our films is they're all sort of set at night mm -hmm. and you have to shoot them normally at night because you have windows and streets and, and, uh, and we don't want to shoot day for night. So we're all terribly tired and upset and, 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 and strung out. And then to shoot these nighttime scenes during the day feeling great with all this great music and the crew really happy with the music. It was just a dream. And also these, these beautiful actresses in the discos. Um, so I thought, beautiful, beautiful women in discos, that would be a cinematic movie. I and mean, so, yeah, the essence of cinema, really. And so, yeah, I thought so. Yeah. I thought it'd be the citizen. I, in fact, was quoted as saying, I thought it'd be the citizen came of romantic comedy. <laughs> <laughs> it, didn't, it didn't quite achieve that. Um, but one of the aspects of a nightclub like Studio 54, and ours is fictional, is that it attract, you run into people from all over. I mean, it's like crazy. Oh, you're from Chicago, you're from San Francisco, and here you are, and here we are together. And so I thought the characters could meet, although mm -hmm. Barcelona supposedly takes place afterwards and um, Metropolitan beforehand, but there are characters from both films in it. Yeah, it's interesting just hearing you talk about all the mythology and how it sort of intersects with one another. Um, I know you're a big fan of classic Hollywood, and I was wondering if you could talk about some of your potential, um, you know, classic films that may have inspired you for this or other films. Well, um, I just got to show um, uh, the Gate of Orsay in Los Angeles at the American uh, Cinema Tech there, which was a great experience because so many of these films I've never seen on the big screen. I was sort of introduced to Top Hat, an incredible uh, screening. Radio City Musical um, programmed uh, Top Hat, the Stair Ginger, Rogers, and so those are two of my favorite films. Um, they're sort of the apex of the RKO musicals, just such a talented group. And a director not many people talk about named Mark Sandrich. His son, Jay Sandrich, directed a lot of the great um, sitcoms of the golden age of sitcoms with Mary Tyler Moore and all that. And so um, I, I love uh, 30s movies, and I find them just remarkable. Their techniques that have never been um, ex ex exceeded or excelled, and and the narrative, um, the, the narrative impulse and, and concision. They're they're 70 minute films. They're just complete films with just so much story, so much sociology, because at the beginning of the um, 30s, they didn't have formulas really, and they're just doing fascinating things. And towards the end of the, of the 30s, they sort of perfected their art, and they're just absolutely fabulous films. And so I, I adore them and uh, keep watching them. And it sort of spoiled me because I find it hard to take. The thing that really, really I hate is this whole thing of single card credits with just inane visuals and then one boring credit and then one boring credit as we have to see some car driving through it. You know, by the end of a credit sequence in a modern movie, there'd be just so much story and life and, and other things like that in a 30s movie. Yeah. They normally had like two or three cards and then away you go. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I definitely think we should bring back those uh, short run times and just being able to tell a story. And I mean, I... I had such great experience with love and friendship as a 90-minute film. Let's <laughs> yeah. let's do that again. I agree. <laughs> I'm all for that. And can you talk a bit about um, class within the film and the idea of like how they talk about preppy and they talk about obviously the urban of bourgeois, which I'm probably butchering the pronunciation right now. But I just find the sort of class dynamic and the awareness that the characters have so interesting. So I'm wondering about your perspective. Well, I sort of born into it or baptized into it because my godfather was a sociologist named Digby Baltzell mm -hmm. who um, 
uh, specialized in this area. He coined the term WASP. He wrote a book, I think his doctoral dissertation was called um, Philadelphia Gentleman, an American Business Aristocracy. And so he, his great book um, is called Puritan Boston Quaker Philadelphia. So he was fascinated by the subject. I think my mother's family, and, and they were great friends with Baby Balsall, they were all um, sort of outcasts in Philadelphia, which I think is the most snobbish city in America. And um, Balsall feels that it's the Quaker tradition of sort of obsession with um, prosperity and conventionality in a certain way. And um, he greatly admired the Puritan tradition coming from Boston. And, um, and so there's a lot of feeling, of, and, I, and my, my favorite uncle, he had all these rules about things like he said that generally like you're in a group and, and you all agree on just a lot of things. So let's say there are three important things, issues people agree on. He said, you can disagree about one big subject from your friends, but if you disagree on two of the three big subjects, you're probably out of the group. And if you disagree with three of the big subjects, you're definitely out of the group. Mm -hmm. and, and you can see this now in politics, that you see people sort of changing, you know, with Trump, a lot of people have to change their politics because suddenly the Republican Party was still totally toxic. Yeah. And so a lot of people say, well, where do I go? What do I? And, and so many people are sort of in their bubbles and it's very strange when you've been in a bubble and you get pushed out of a bubble and like, mm -hmm. oh my gosh, it looks yeah. differently from the outside. Absolutely. Well, should we see if anyone in the audience has any questions? If they want to get medals. They if they want to get medals. Um, there? Yes. Uh, uh, two things. One was... Only Evelyn, one medal. Oh, <laughs> I can live with that. Uh, was Vile Bodies by Evelyn Wall, did that influence you at all? Totally. Yeah, I thought so. Totally. This is the medal. Oh. Oh. Wow. <laughs> okay, thank you. And uh, two, you're quite a natty dresser yourself. You have a pleat that I could set my watch to. Um, when you watch the film, and there's H.E. Harris, I mean, the, the scene where you're talking, um, where Nick's talking about um, barbarism, it's in front of MJ Nudes, which is the saddle shop on uh, Madison that's been gone for God knows how long. I thought it was Miller. Oh, was it? Something Miller, J.G. Miller, L. L. Miller, I don't know. But, and, but anyway, anyway it, was, it, was, it, was, it was a weird thing to have a horseback riding. Yes, it is. Yeah. But um, when I, when I like, fashion plays such a huge part in this film, and you just said yourself, uh, what, what do you, have you just, how did you sign that letter to the, the Times? Or oh, what? oh, Executive Director of New York Committee to Save the White Tie. Yes. <laughs> and now, like, that world seems to me completely gone. I've never worn a tuxedo, which is really disappointing. Um, but I don't know. It's it's it's. Um, so is it completely gone? I mean, it's really wonderful. I think to be walking up um, Park Avenue in the evening, and there are a lot of people in tuxedos going to some sort of charity affair thing. And Still? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, I'm not around then, but yeah. uh, that's okay. I mean, I was just I'm going to a wedding um, um, on Saturday, and I was just so relieved that it wasn't going to be black tie. Just, <laughs> but I mean, what do you have an opinion on like menswear in terms of just like? I think you already won your medal. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions, menswear or otherwise? Okay. Um, yeah, Nick, over there. Uh, I was just curious, you know, you brought Eigenman and Nichols um, to Barcelona, which I watched that recently in the good Warner Brothers movie. And I was wondering if you had any trouble bringing these two unknown actors who had really only done your first movie onto your studio project. Well, it only says it's Warner Brothers movie now because um, it was Castle Rock, and um, so um, Metropolitan um, was picked up by New Line Cinema after everyone else had turned it down, um, and um, it sort of failed upward. It got into Sundance and, and did well. Everyone else had rejected it before it was in a festival, and. Um, New Line hired um, the producer's rep to be the marketing guy on that. So it's, they sort of formed this company like Fine Line Features, so the specialty unit of, of, of New Line. So I wanted to just do Barcelona with Fine Line Features with Ira Deutschman there. And Ira Deutschman has done a wonderful documentary about the New York cinema figure Don Ruboff, um, Searching for Mr. Ruboff, which I really recommend. Um, and um, so I was just going to do that, and then the Castrock people, um, this company, Rob Runner's company, Castrock, just a wonderful company. Um, but I just thought they were just typical Hollywood people, and I, 
I gave the impression of not being accessible or like hard to get to because I was living in Spain. And so I had a breakfast with them at the Polo Lounge, two people from um, Castle Rock, actually great people, really funny, really great. And yes, yeah, Spinal Tap created Castle Rock. It com all comes out of Spinal Tap. And um, I, I said, well, I can't, you know, this person is too low budget for you. And they kept saying, oh, no, no, uh, you know, our Sony deal is seven million and up. You're gonna be like two or three million. We can just do it and, and let Fine Line have it. And so it was a Castle Rock film then Turner bought Castle Rock, and then Warner's bought Turner, and now it says Warner Brothers, but we didn't do it with Warner's. I did do Last Days of Disco uh, with Warner's and Polygram, and they made it much too expensive because we had to do everything by the book. And, you know, and um, so that's the only film that wasn't profitable for the investors, Disco, because the budget had to go up too much. Yeah. Thank you, thanks for the question. Um, I think Middle. Oh, another thing. I think we have time for one more question before we wrap up. So, who's most enthusiastic? Who's most enthusiastic? <laughs> Someone not up there. Hi. Yeah. Um. I. I. I love the philosophical discussions that the characters have, and I wonder for you how much of that is um, either a, a witnessing of philosophical discussions that others are having versus a, a grappling with something that you're thinking about. The second. <laughs> so, but it's all very, very superficial, I can assure you. <laughs> my, my knowledge of these subjects is not just the Wikipedia entry, it's just the first paragraph of the Wikipedia entry. <laughs> yeah, it's getting very existential. Where does the philosophy come from? Do we have time for one more or we have to go? There's another screen. Oh, did, did she get their medal? I did. I did. Okay. <laughs> Yes. Um, just was wondering, did the process of making Metropolitan change your original idea for Barcelona substantially? Did 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 making Metropolitan change yes. the idea for Barcelona? Um, I don't think so. I mean, I think that's that was pretty much what I wanted to do. But I had the resources because Castle Rock. Um, um, so, so the budget of this was, um, I think we had $210,000 in the film by the time we started to sell it. And um, it's, it's cost was probably two thirty, dollars and then with deferments, maybe up to $300,000. And um, uh, Barcelona is a little more than $3 million. But it could have been cheaper. Wow. No, no, no Damsels was really cheap. Maybe it looks it, but. <laughs> That's why it's my favorite. And Metropolitan is such a great look on the budget. I mean, it just it really holds up. Well, I have to say the the projection here is really good. This, <laughs> yes, this yes. screen looks really good. Yeah. So thanks, thank you for coming. Thank you, everybody. Uh, happy holidays, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, um, everything else.